Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Nuffield Foundation for the launch of this research tonight. My name is Rob Street and I'm director of the Justice Programme here at the Foundation. So thank you all very much for turning out on this midweek winter's evening. And it's very good to see so many of you. And it's testament, I think, to the significance of the research we will be discussing. We're very pleased to have supported Professor John Jackson and his colleagues in undertaking this important study, addressing, as it does, such a critical issue in the criminal trial process. We particularly welcome the focus on the treatment of vulnerable witnesses, which aligns with our wider interest in understanding the impact on individuals of involvement with the justice system, as well as, of course, the fairness and effectiveness of the system's operation. We also very much welcome the insights that the cross-jurisdiction focus this, this project has produced. So there's much to consider and discuss, and we have an excellent panel to help us with that. So before I hand over to our chair to introduce the event, just a few housekeeping points. Firstly, fire alarm. We actually had a fire alarm test this afternoon, so if the alarm sounds, we have to treat it for real. And leave the building promptly by one of the stairwells by the side of the lift shaft. And then we muster outside to the left. We will be there to help you do that. Secondly, we are recording the presenters and the panel speakers, but not the Q&A today. And that's at the request of the research team to use a recording for internal university purposes and to share with colleagues who can't make it. So just so you, you're, you're clear on that. So with that done, let me introduce our chair. Um, Her Honour, Judge Sarah Whitehouse KC. She is a senior circuit judge at the Central Criminal Court and also a visiting fellow at the Nottingham University Law School, which is her connection with this work originally. She has a long standing involvement with this policy and topic area. And of course, she has a very keen and expert interest in the findings of the study. She also very kindly provided the foreword for the report. So. Judge Whitehouse, let me hand over to you. Thank you. I must give one word of correction. I'm a visiting professor at the Nottingham, Nottingham Trent, the Nottingham Law School, as opposed to the university, um, and very proud to be. Um, it's very good to see everybody. It's been my privilege to be involved in this project um, in various ways from the very beginning. Um, we all know um, that for well over a century, probably 150 years, uh, cross-examination has changed beyond all recognition in substance and in form, in the way that we ask questions, in the topics that we're allowed to ask about, uh, and the, the limitations upon it. Um, but change happens um, for a great many reasons. Um, it comes about, for example, in cross-examination, um, because of advances in, in medical knowledge, in psychiatry and psychology in particular, um, and by advances in technology. So, so today we can, for example, um, beam people into courts through video links in a way that would have been impossible um, even 30 years ago, I'd suggest. And um, we have rapid access, of course, now to information. So the average person across the globe um, knows far more today about the effect, for example, of drugs on reliability and perceptions than might have been the case uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and also, overwhelmingly, of course, society's attitudes have changed. Um, in 1958, and this will be a familiar quote to some of you because it really is so extraordinary, Lord Goddard, then the Chief Justice, um, said that the court deprecates the calling of a child of five years of age as a witness because the jury couldn't attach any value to the evidence of a child of five. And it is ridiculous to suppose that they could. Now, that was in 1958, but that was actually endorsed with approval um, by a judge in 1986 who said that that was a, a valid and sensible proposition and had remained um, uh, on the untrammeled practice of the courts. So in 1986, a child of five considered to be wholly unreliable. Uh, and that seems bizarre to us today, I suppose. Um, but now that children often do become witnesses, we have, of course, developed ways of helping them to, to give evidence, which treats them as the children that they are uh, and not as miniature adults. And other examples of the way in which society has changed uh, the way in which we cross-examine, the topics we ask about, 
um, may be found in a, a number of other examples. For example, um, cases involving sexual offending. Once upon a time, uh, a prostitute would have been considered unworthy of belief merely because she was a prostitute. Previous sexual experience was always considered to be relevant to the issue of consent, uh, especially if the previous sexual activity was alleged uh, to have taken place with the uh, alleged rapist. Um, a married woman couldn't be raped by her husband until 1992, uh, an example of changing social attitudes feeding into uh, cross-examination, although it wasn't in fact until the 1999 Act um, that um, the idea that consent to sexual intercourse must be given on every occasion, regardless of past activity, um, that fed into the 1999 Act uh, and, of course, limited uh, the questions that can be asked about previous sexual history. So another example of changing social attitudes, um, feeding into cross-examination content and techniques. And it goes on. Previous convictions, once upon a time, um, they were absolutely fair game and any defendant with previous convictions could be cross-examined uphill and down dale on the basis that a man uh, who might have been convicted, let's say, of uh, grievous bodily harm uh, was by some curious uh, twist of logic um, an inveterate liar um, and who could not be taken seriously as a credible witness. Once upon a time, you only have to read Dickens, which wasn't that long ago, anybody who was poor was considered to be unworthy of belief when compared with those of much higher estate. Now, I can still recall a time in my career at the bar when it was assumed that police officers never ever told lies. And any barrister who dared to cross-examine a police officer uh, on the basis that they were a liar, um, might be met with robust criticism from a judge for having the temerity to suggest that PC Plod might have been lying. And so only the most courageous barristers would dare uh, to suggest it back in the day. Changing attitudes. Uh, and the role of judges has also um, had a big impact, but judges have changed. Um, in the way that they uh, manage cases and in the way that they do or don't um, interfere uh, in cross-examination. There was a judge, um, a well-known judge, um, uh, uh, Sir Peter Eglin, um, who was a judge at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and it was said of him that in his court, um, cross-examination was never allowed to proceed without him interrupting. Because immediately that something favouring the defence was elicited in cross-examination, um, Sir Peter would in interpose questions of his own, usually with some success, in order to displace any favourable uh, uh, answer that had been elicited. Uh, and in fact, once the witnesses had all finished, Sir Peter Edlin would then settle down to recall them all himself and ask them questions himself, thereby destroying the defence case. And he then finished off, of course, in his summing up. Now, judges today would never take over cross-examination, I hope, quite so extensively. We tend today to call it um, inviting clarification from the witness, um, not cross-examining. So there are a number of factors which feed into the changing way in which we cross-examine, uh, and they can't be viewed, any of them, in isolation. And so this is really my um, take-home introduction to, to this evening. What is very important, it seems to me, is that everybody involved in this field, in whatever capacity it is, continues to reflect and to discuss what we do and why we do it and how we do it. What is the purpose? Not only the practicalities, it's the, the philosophical questions. What's the purpose of a criminal trial? Is it a search for truth, as some would say, uh, or is it in fact to establish whether or not the evidence establishes the guilt of a defendant beyond reasonable doubt. Um, does a case have to be put to a witness? Well, why should it be? Uh, what's effective? Um, is it fair to the witness actually not to put the case? Um, what are the rules? Um, why are the rules different for defendants as opposed to other witnesses and should they be? Um, are any of these innovations or some of them actually helpful to witnesses? Um, is it right that the best evidence is always achieved by pre-recorded cross-examination. Should it be the case um, that in every sex case, 
um, there is pre-recorded cross-examination regardless of the age of the witness. How can we use our technology more effectively in our courts and how are we training our advocates and is it effective? And aren't all witnesses vulnerable in some shape or form, whether in crime or in civil law or anywhere else? And what are their vulnerabilities? Uh, and how are those vulnerabilities best to be addressed? So we need, need to acknowledge, it seems to me, that every case is different and the context of every case is different. Uh, and we have to adjust what we do accordingly. And most important of all, we need to be prepared uh, in whatever our capacity is, whether as judge or as barrister, whether as intermediary, in any other capacity, a police officer, prosecutor, whatever you are, um, we need to be prepared to consider other perspectives. Because if we are going to chortle, as we do, at the old fashioned attitudes of the past, then we must be make, sure, make sure that we ourselves don't get stuck in our own uh, well trammeled views and ideas about these things. We must always be prepared to um, reflect and discuss and change what we think. And so this report, which is being launched today, uh, is an invaluable contribution to these ongoing debates. And I do pay tribute um, to uh, the Nuffield Foundation and the Nottingham Law School and Nottingham University uh, and those whose skill and dedication um, put so much into this report, which will inform this debate uh, I am sure, uh, in the months and years to come. Uh, and an event such as this evening gives all of us the opportunity to exchange ideas, to discuss ideas, and perhaps sometimes to change our own perspectives. So I'm going to introduce now, um, uh, to begin with, two of those um, key players from uh, the Nottingham North School and Nottingham University. Um, John Jackson, the Emeritus, Emeritus Professor of Comparative Criminal, Comparative Criminal Law and Procedure, um, at the School of uh, Law, uh, and he has a number of other things on his CV, but in particular, um, he's led a number of large scale projects in the criminal court, so ideally placed um, to lead this project. Uh, and Jonathan Doak, um, Professor of Criminal Justice and Associate Dean uh, of Research um, in the Nottingham Law School at Nottingham Trent. Uh, and I think we're going to begin um, with John Professor Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the sight of uh, witnesses being quizzed at the COVID inquiry, including a past um, present Prime Minister and just yesterday, the uh, previous uh, First Minister of Scotland, has illustrated, I think, how effective cross-examination can be in bringing to light omissions and inconsistencies in, in witnesses' statements. Um, but as the Chair has sort of alluded to, uh, cross-examination has been changing. And it can be a particularly ex distressing experience, as we know, for vulnerable witnesses. Um, and in recent years, a number of adjustments have been made to try to ease their distress and to enable them to achieve what's called best evidence. Uh, the, the adjustments don't just relate to special measures, but to the actual way in which witnesses uh, are being cross-examined. And after the Court of Appeal, uh, just over oh, well over 10 years ago now, issued rulings to the effect that advocates need to change their approach towards the examination, cross-examination of vulnerable witnesses. There was some research, uh, Emily Henderson in particular conducted, um, which showed that attitudes and practitioners were receptive to these changes. But since that time, and this was over 10 years ago since that research was done, um, there's been very little research uh, that's made a systematic examination of the extent to which there's been actual change on the ground. And our research aims really to, to remedy that situation. Uh, over the past three to four years, we've adopted a, a multi-stranded methodology, to use that term, to give a rounded picture of how the cross-examination of vulnerable and non-vulnerable witnesses is conducted in jury trials across five Crown Court centres in England and Wales. Um, this has involved the observation of trials uh, interviewing judges, advocates and intermediaries and analysing transcripts containing cross-examinations from the observed trials. Uh, the mixed methodology approach enabled us 
to cross check what we were told with what was actually happening uh, on the ground, uh, how witnesses were being questioned, um, and to make observations there about uh, the, the length of questions, the tone, the pace, the content, um, and combining that then with a linguistic analysis uh, of how questions are structured uh, and whether the good practices that have been set out for questioning vulnerable witnesses in the Advocates Gateway and the Inns of Court College of Advocacy, which a number of you sure are familiar with, are they actually being followed? Most of the trials we observed involved vulnerable or intimidated witnesses. Uh, a considerable proportion, 62%, involved rape and serious sexual offences. Um, but we also observed a number of other trials from murder and GBH down to, in the Crown Court, uh, driving offences um, as well. And our observations extended. Uh, we, we looked at um, also the way in which defendants were being cross-examined cross as well as prosecution witnesses. And we wanted to look at the whole trial uh, in, so that we could get a, a full picture of what was happening, the effect of cross-examination we would have on, on the trial as a whole monitoring the use of special measures, ground rules, hearings, uh, where sometimes they happened in the courtroom itself at the Crown Court stage, um, and the extent to which other evidence, uh, including agreed evidence, is being used to curtail uh, the need for cross-examination of vulnerable witnesses. Another important aim uh, of the research was to identify evidence-based uh, solutions that enhance the capacity of vulnerable people to participate within the criminal trial. And to do this, we adopted a comparative approach, uh, as uh, Rob has already mentioned. In 2021, two years ago, we published an international review of the law, policy and practice of cross-examination across a number of countries. Uh, we've also observed trials and carried out interviews in the neighbouring jurisdictions of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, and we came across some interesting differences uh, between those jurisdictions in England and Wales in the course of our research. Uh, taking one or two examples, in Northern Ireland, the registered intermediary scheme applies to both. These are obviously people who are communication experts to assist uh, witnesses, facilitate them in giving evidence. Um, in Northern Ireland, the scheme applies, the registered scheme, uh, both to prosecution witnesses and defendants as well. Um, and in Ireland, there's a new professional diploma in intermediary studies that's actually been launched. Scotland hasn't adopted intermediaries as such, but both there and in Ireland, there's a statutory scheme in place to allow supporters to sit alongside vulnerable witnesses um, and, and to assist them in, in that manner. In Scotland, the practice of taking evidence on commission before the trial has been extended to, has been extended to allow vulnerable witnesses, including adult sex complainants, to give all of their evidence together in one pre-recorded hearing. And this appears to have worked more smoothly than pre-recorded cross-examination has maybe gone down in England and Wales, which came under quite a lot of criticism in our research for the way it's been rolled out. In order to, Johnson's going to say a bit more about our findings, but I'd like just to thank the analysts others have done, the, the Nuffield Foundation for making the research possible, and our advisory group, a number of whom are in the audience today, uh, for their input into the research. Uh, core research of this kind, of course, can't succeed without the goodwill and cooperation of those on the ground. And we began our search during the pandemic when the courts were subject to COVID restrictions. And we'd like to thank the resident judges and court staff for facilitating the research at a time when I'm sure uh, they could have done without us. Um, we'd also like to thank all the judicial, um, legal and intermediary interviewees who gave up their time uh, and gave us some very wrong reflected reflections of their considerable experience over time. The research has been, I think it's been alluded to, a collaboration between universities, um, uh, University of Nottingham and Nottingham Trent uh, University. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to be working as a team with them, with a Jonathan Dope already mentioned from Nottingham Trent, uh, David Wright, our search team on the front row here, David Wright, uh, our lingu ling uh, linguist expert from Nottingham Trent School, um, Debbie Cooper from the University of Nottingham, Candida Saunders did a lot of the observing of the trials, um, and we're all part of the team and it was has been a, a truly team effort. Uh, and I'm happy to say that they're all happily waiting here in the front row to answer any questions that you might have for them uh, later. 
Uh, but now for now, I'll pass over to Jonathan to say a few words more about our findings. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I think uh, you know it, it's it's always difficult to to summarise mm. findings and recommendations concisely of, of you know what what has been quite a um, a, a long, mm. detailed, and complex project. But you know we we, we do hope that the uh, findings and recommendations that come out of that are are uh, evidence based and uh, will give some food for thought in uh, the places that matter. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, uh, but I suppose there are three broad conclusions that are worth highlighting. Um, so many of you will be familiar with the, the concept of a best evidence model of cross-examination, that we're moving away from this sort of gladiatorial style of advocacy um, towards this idea that the, the trial should be about producing the best possible evidence. <clears throat> and uh, we saw, I think, across all of the jurisdictions um, that uh, that was generally seen as a good thing, uh, that best evidence is generally uh, produced under conditions that are conducive to producing it. And uh, there was, as such, I think, uh, maybe not universally, but but certainly pretty much across the board, um, advocates, judges and uh, uh, prosecutors, intermediaries generally uh, find that were, were, were largely favourably disposed. Um, some advocates in particular uh, raised some questions about whether the, the about increased case management uh, through the, the obviously the, the growth of ground rules hearings, whether that was perhaps being somewhat overzealous, whether questions were perhaps being curtailed uh, too much in a way that might adversely affect the outcome of, of cases. And, and that wasn't just defence were saying that, but also uh, <clears throat> prosecutors. But uh, by and large, um, as I say, the reception was positive and we had very few express uh, any concerns around potential interference with the right to a fair trial. Um, the second key finding, I suppose, is that um, while most of our participants were positively um, viewed the changes in a positive sense, the effectiveness of measures um, were often being thwarted or undermined to some extent at least through poor technology. Um, so there were a number of cases um, uh, that we observed where uh, technology was, was not good, where um, uh, transmissions were interrupted, where either sound or, or, or vision was poor, um, that um, sometimes um, uh, led to delays in trials, um, in particular, uh, the ABE interviews, that's the, 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 the pre-recorded evidence in chief interviews that are often played back at trial, uh, were variable in quality. And we had a, a number of cases as well where pre-recorded cross-examinations uh, had to be postponed because recording facilities failed. Uh, while our, our data highlighted uh, many differences in the way that vulnerable witnesses were cross-examined uh, compared with other uh, non-vulnerable witnesses, though, as uh, Judge Whitehouse said, perhaps all witnesses are vulnerable to an extent. Uh, what's become apparent that the changes have yet to met metaf metamorphosize, yet, yet to... Um, take effect in a way that shapes a consistent set of practices for achieving best evidence for all kinds of vulnerable witnesses. In other words, practice isn't quite as consistent or as coherent as we might like. Instances of bad practice were encountered as well as some very good practice. Um, 
and where we saw on occasion some very innovative adaptations being made to trials, we also saw in other quarters um, uh, a reluctance to <coughs> make uh, the adaptations that would have helped to ensure best evidence. Now, our report proposes a, a total of, of 27 recommendations and, and time obviously precludes uh, me going into to, to those in, in any sort of detail here. Um, suffice to say, um, a, a few headline points. The majority of our recommendations are cross-jurisdictional in nature. So the four jurisdictions we looked at, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Ireland, um, notwithstanding their differences, by and large, they, they are from the, 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 the common law adversarial tradition. So a lot of the recommendations are cross jurisdictions, while others uh, relate to uh, some specific jurisdictions, in particular, as, as, as John alluded to, how we might potentially learn from each other and learn from, from innovative practices elsewhere. And indeed, um, the, the report also makes references to some other jurisdictions that we didn't study. Um, we did as, as part of the research a review of international best practice. And um, in that report, we also looked at other, uh, particularly common law jurisdictions, but uh, also we looked at um, international, uh, I suppose, emerging indicators of good practice, points of consensus in, in international soft law documents. And uh, I think there's a lot we can take from that in the, the, the longer term. Um, our recommendations fall under eight main headings. Um, so I'll summarize these very briefly with, without going into specifics. So the first one, as you, you may have gathered, is technology. Uh, need for standardization, need for improvement. Second one was uh, special measures. Uh, there were a few recommendations here, uh, but as John alluded to, one of them was giving some thought to the possibility that all vulnerable witnesses should give all their evidence in advance of trial. So similar to the, the Scottish model of evidence on commission. Uh, familiarization. Uh, again, there's there's been a lot of talk about this over the years, but it still seems that not all vulnerable witnesses are fully confident and familiar with um, uh, the, the particularly the, the technologies involved, and there may be room there for for practice sessions. Um, uh, intermediaries, um, we uh, intermediaries by and large, we we find we're we're, we're doing a fantastic job. Uh, but what we did find out, again, as, as John alluded to, that there is uh, some difference, particularly in England and Wales, about provision uh, between uh, registered intermediaries for non defendant witnesses and then uh, intermediaries for defendant witnesses who fall outside the scheme. So uh, we would recommend uh, that some thought be given to, to a unitary approach in terms of uh, service provision and that echoes into sort of a broader point about equality that uh, vulnerable defendants are by and large not treated uh, in the same way as vulnerable non-defendants. Uh, so in terms of fairness and equality and consistency of, 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 of service provision. Um, and it's been interesting as well because we've looked obviously at Northern Ireland and Ireland are much smaller jurisdictions. England and Wales are much larger jurisdictions. And it's been interesting to learn, uh, you know, about uh, there are pros and cons of being a smaller jurisdiction uh, versus a large jurisdiction. And one of the, the pros might be flexibility, uh, responsiveness. And um, particularly, I think Judge Smith later might pick up on this point about how uh, uh, everyone involved in a courtroom setting, uh, judges, advocates, intermediaries might learn from each other uh, in terms of uh, joint service provision, joint training, and how that would ref be reflected in England and Wales, I think is a, a really interesting point for consideration, whether there might be more scope for local court uh, user groups um, and, uh, and that type of thing. Um, and then there's also, as I say, there are the immediate uh, 
recommendations we can make that you know should be given immediate thought but then there's also you know when we talk about longer term vision and we think about innovation so that's where i think we can maybe pause for thought um it's not going to happen overnight by any means but um looking at and drawing on broader international experience particularly um, the use of the, the barnahus model which is sort of a specialized cross-disciplinary uh, approach to, to to children's justice that, that that's come from a scandinavian model uh, it has been piloted in this country and, and in other jurisdictions as well and whether that might in in due course uh, shape uh, policy and practice um, so that's a, as I say, it's a, it's a brief flavour of what we uh, recommended, but I'm sure my, my colleagues here will be, be very keen to pick up uh, on any of that in, in the Q&A after our speakers. Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> now we've got four speakers and they're all very distinguished and their CVs are really quite exhausting to read. Um, because they're so lengthy, lengthy and so impressive. But um, with their consent, um, I'm going to save time because you want to hear from them um, really and what they have to say. And also we, we need to um, close by um, five to seven and we need time for Q&A. Um, I'm just going to give you their names um, and uh, a, a, a brief word. So the first is Professor Penny Cooper, um, who is the co-founder and former chair of the Advocates Gateway. Thank you very much. Just to mix things up a bit, I'm going to stay here to say what I want to say, really because I'll probably tread on someone's toes if I get up or trip up, and I want to spare you that sight of me tripping up as I get on or off this podium. Well, it was my privilege to sit on the advisory board. Um, congratulations to John, Jonathan, Candida, David, Debbie for your project, and I echo the thanks that have already been expressed to everybody who took part in this project. In my short talk, I want to highlight some findings that come out of this research about ground rules hearings and intermediaries, mainly because David Wurzel and I trained the first cohort of intermediaries back in 2003 and trained many more intermediaries after that. And in fact, we're still training intermediaries. We're going off to Limerick in March to do some work in the Republic of Ireland. But back in 2003, in the law school classroom at Princeton, I, the teacher, was taught by the intermediary students about tag questions and why I should avoid using tag questions when cross-examining vulnerable witnesses. I discovered firsthand how challenging it was to overcome the ingrained habits of cross-examination. In that same classroom, I said to the trainee intermediaries, you must include for us barristers a table of recommendations in your report mm -hmm. called ground rules. I thought that was as good a name as any. And two decades ago, David and I in that classroom implored the intermediaries to request a ground rules hearing in front of the judge. I'm pleased that Mapping the Changing Face finds that there is a general positive consensus about the added value of intermediaries and that ground rules hearings are increasingly commonplace. I'm less pleased to read the timing of ground rules hearings is not always ideal and sometimes there is a lack of judicial continuity. Sadly, the perfunctory approach to ground rules hearings that I wrote about 10 years ago has not gone the way of the dodo. Mapping the changing face indicates that much less common are ground rules hearings for defendants and submissions of written questions for vulnerable defendants are much rarer too. This is extremely worrying, especially if you put it in the context of other research about vulnerable defendants. And there's plenty of recent research about that. So I recommend if you want to know more to go to the work of Tom Smith and Nicole Renahan at the Neurodivergence in Criminal Justice Network and also read the prescriptions of the three doctors, Dr. Roxana Dehagani, Dr. Samantha Fairclough and Dr. John Taggart in their blog, Defending Vulnerability. The need for reform for vulnerable dependents is obvious. Part of that is increased use of ground rules hearings and written questions. And these things don't require lots of money, but they do require attitudes to evolve. When I qualified as a barrister 34 years ago, the instances of and the impact of academic research on courtroom witness questioning was barely perceptible. Not so now. 
Mapping the changing face is a major addition to an international tapestry of research informing courtroom practice. For example, the findings of this research study will impact my review of the Tasmanian intermediary pilot, which will be published later this year. Closer to home, the tapestry of courtroom research continues to grow, and the coroner's court research project led by Professor Jessica Jacobson, who's hiding at the back there, um, a project that I contributed to a little, is going to be launching a website in May with a range of outputs, including practitioner guidance. If the justice system isn't evolving, it's dying, in my opinion. But thanks to mapping the changing face, we know the system is evolving. We also know it's improving in some areas, but it still needs to improve in others. So thank you, John, Jonathan, Candida, David and Debbie, and of course to your funders, the Nuffield Foundation. And that's it from me. Well, um, Penny, of course, will be available for Q&A at the end, but also um, to, to speak to afterwards, because there can be few people with such a, a broad and um, long history of involvement in this particular area, especially in the um, intermediaries and, and ground rules. So thank you, Penny. Um, the next speaker is the Recorder of Belfast, um, Her Honour Judge Patricia Smith. I don't know whether you're going to sit down or whether you want to stand up. Well, it's entirely up to you. I'm the only one with a PowerPoint, so I'm going to stand. <laughs> Um, Joyce Plotnikoff uh, described the slow road to best evidence in terms of picking and screening. And I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with that. And um, for those of us who have been tasked with um, making the aspirations a reality in terms of enabling vulnerable witnesses to give their best evidence, this is probably the hardest challenge we've ever had. And although, as um, our previous speakers have indicated, we have come a long way in terms of the changes that we have made, but we can't be complacent about that. We could very easily slip back into bad practices. And what I want to talk about is this. <laughs> What to do when culture change starts to go wrong? Because it can do. And I'm going to talk about this issue in the context of a very successful protocol to fast track sexual offence cases involving children. And um, how signs begin to appear that things weren't quite as they should be. How we got it all back on track. And in doing so, how we made it even better for children in Northern Ireland. So just to bring us back to where we started from in Northern Ireland, um, Sir John Gillen in his groundbreaking report in 2019 um, described the situation of children in Northern Ireland. And it is really, truly shocking to see that Children make up the majority of victims of sexual crime, 58% in that year leading up to the report, which was mirrored in England and Wales. But in relation to the delay in progressing those cases, 928 days was recorded as the median for all sexual offences involving children. And that is a staggering figure. And what it actually means in reality is that a young child could be asking to give evidence about something that had happened nearly half her life ago. So um, some of us decided enough was enough. And we wanted to create a new culture. And um, I don't know if you will recognize this in England and Wales, but certainly in Northern Ireland, my experience was that the various stakeholders liked to have brick walls between them and um, didn't like working together. And certainly the various stakeholders would not have um, demonstrated their own difficulties and vulnerabilities and issues 
within their own organisations. And historically, from my experience um, in the judiciary, we pointed fingers at each other. We blamed everybody else for the problem. So something needed to change in order to change the culture for children. And um, what we did was we put together a small group of influential people across all of the stakeholders. And these were people who wanted to try and change the culture. They weren't made to do it. They put their hands up and said, let's try. And essentially, by working together in a way that stakeholders have never worked together, by acknowledging our own problems within our own organisations and going away and thinking how we could do better in our own places, we began to build trust between us. And that, in terms of culture change, is simply vital. <laughs> and sometimes the law can be a very important tool for change. And as it turned out, we discovered that there was a little provision sitting idly on a shelf somewhere that had never been used and which was going to transform the lives of children. And this was Article 4 of the Children's Evidence, Northern Ireland Order, 1995. And essentially, it is a tool to fast track a case involving a child where it's a sexual, violent or an offence of cruelty. One of those three types of offence. And um, this is a tool that can only be used by the director himself of public prosecutions. And if he thinks that the evidence is sufficient for um, committal for trial, he can immediately transfer the case to the Crown Court without having to touch base in the Magistrates Court. And in Northern Ireland, sadly, we still have the committal procedure, which is a major source of delay in all criminal cases. We're in, on course to get rid of it, but we haven't quite got rid of it yet. So this tool enabled the director to actually just bypass all of the obstacles that historically have been in place. But before I tell you what the new plan was that has changed children's lives in Northern Ireland, we're going to tell you what it was based on. And it was based on a really complicated issue. Was that? Just take the child's case out of the queue and move it to the top. So complaint number 3000 comes into the PSNI. It doesn't stay at number 3,000, it goes to number one. When the case goes to the Public Prosecution Service, it's number one. When it comes into the court service, it's number one. And of course, why do we do this for children? Because we know that vulnerable witnesses have to wait so long for their trial. What's so special about a child? Well, there are three things that are so special about a child. Firstly, the impact on a child of having to remember traumatic events from a long time ago means that we are effectively re-traumatising those children. The second issue is this, and this affects uh, defendants in particular. It's this, you know, how can we be sure that a child is remembering the actual events? Is the child remembering the ABE that she watched before the trial started? How can we test the reliability of the evidence? So there are all sorts of excellent reasons which justify treating a child differently. And as one of our speakers said earlier, a child is not a cut down version of an adult. A child is a completely different person with different needs. And we have to react to that. So we all went away and thought how we could make something change within our own organisations. And um, this is what we came up with. We decided to start with um, cases involving children under 13 for two reasons. One, because um, usually there isn't a lot of investigation needed. There aren't a lot of telephones, for example. And also because the law recognises that um, there is a division in terms of a lot of the offences are for children under 13. And the police agreed 
that for these cases in a particular area of Northern Ireland, Belfast, that they would um, undertake to complete and file the complaint within four to six weeks of, of the complaint. The PPS agreed to make, make a decision within three weeks. The police agreed to work with the defence at the earliest possible stage so that they were aware of the issues. And a trial would be listed within eight weeks of arraignment. And this was an enormously ambitious plan, but we weren't happy with that. We wanted to do more, but we knew we couldn't commit to more. So what we did was we coined a phrase, managing cases in the spirit of the protocol. And what that meant was for any child, um, even a child over 13, we were going to try and speed things up. We were going to bear in mind this is a child. So we, we were thinking big, but we were being realistic. And that's what we achieved. In 2019, the median days for all sexual offences involving children, 928 days. March 2023, 237 days. Um, but as COVID hit, um, I began to, began to notice that um, some of the cases coming through did have delay. They weren't, strictly speaking, protocol cases, but the children were young enough that the delay shouldn't have been there. And um, I made inquiries as to how this had happened, but I didn't really get, a, um, get an answer that made a lot of sense. And I could feel the brick wall starting to build again. So what we did was we got together again. We brought together the small group of people. We didn't allow any observers in. And that's that, that's not a disrespect to all of the people who have an interest in this area. It's simply that if you want people to be open about the issues and the problems, you need to be able to trust that the information isn't going to go outside the room. So we discovered that um, since COVID, huge turnovers of staff had occurred within all of the organisations the key people who had made this happen weren't there anymore. They had all moved on. And large organisations find it very difficult to continue cascading the messages. So we literally went back to basics. We got together in a small group and we realised we needed two things to maintain what we had achieved and moving forward in the future to make sure that we weren't going to lose the momentum that we had achieved. We needed an IT solution. We couldn't depend on people passing on the messages anymore. And of course, as soon as you mention IT, everybody thinks money. It turned out that the IT solution wouldn't cost any money at all because we already had a system of flagging domestic abuse cases in Northern Ireland, right across the system. And all we needed to do was amend that for children. So we didn't have to rely on anybody's memory about children or pilots. But we also needed to develop a step-by-step -step process for each stakeholder. And that was because of the turnover of staff that we didn't need to worry about people remembering. We would have it in writing, part of the manual, part of the process. So this is where we're at. We have just recently created a seamless process document from complaint to trial. All of the parts of the, um, of the uh, system work together. It's step by step. It's part of everybody's manual. The IT solution is in train. It'll take a little bit of time, but it's in train. And we did something even more. What we decided was we knew that we could expedite cases for children under 13 if we kept our minds on it. We decided we would expedite cases involving children under 16. And we wouldn't just do it in Belfast. We would do it throughout Northern Ireland. So we know that the tight timescales of the protocol won't be possible for this larger group of children, because this is the group of children where we do have phones and examinations, etc. But the fact that we are now committing to this, the fact that we now have 
seamless process documents and we will very shortly have a system that will flag every case involving a child from complaint to the end and um, is a major step forward. So I think what I want to say is simply this, don't take culture change for granted. It's been a hard won success for all of us in making the changes, but we have to make sure that we keep making those strides. So thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. <clears throat> when I spoke earlier, I spoke about the importance of swapping ideas and continuing to reflect uh, on how um, we um, manage uh, our cross-examination, continuing to exchange ideas and being prepared to um, think outside our own um, uh, tram lines and, and consider what others do. And the um, Northern Ireland experience, I think, is fascinating, particularly the um, expediting of those cases. That's a remarkable reduction in delays. Thank you. Um, we're next going to hear from um, Mary Pryor, the Vice Chair of the Criminal Bar Association and a barrister with a long, long and distinguished um, career in defending and in prosecuting. And also um, Mary is a recorder uh, as well, so it's a recorder. I am not an academic. I'm one of those people that drives the bus. I am delighted that the Nuffield Foundation assisted us all with research that talked to bus drivers. It is a refreshing change and it is particularly so at a time when the criminal bar is on its knees. We have 2,400 people conducting criminal cases across the entire country, and that number is going down every single year. Part of the reason for that is the exhaustion which comes from having too few. And that can lead us to become completely focused on the next case without lifting our heads. But these are exciting times for practitioners because the world is changing. Her Honour Judge Whitehouse gave you some descriptions of things that have changed from the 1980s. When I started at the bar, it was impermissible for women to wear trousers, whatever the weather. In fact, it took until 1995, I expect that's before some of you were born. It took until 1995 for women to be allowed to wear trousers in this profession. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because times are changing, but change now is at a pace. And one of the most exciting things is the mergers that occur between academics, practitioners and experts in psychiatry and psychology who also involve themselves in the court processes with the judiciary and with criminal cases. This collaboration generally is key to making progress for vulnerable witnesses. We are so privileged to read this research because it's been done carefully. It's been done thoroughly and it is highly professional. If I had met you all before, I would have kissed you on the foreheads, you brilliant people. And here is why. There is a bus at the moment which relates to cases involving vulnerable witnesses, which says that juries can't be trusted with these cases because they're all biased. And which says that no one can do these cases because barristers aren't very competent. They shout at people, wave very uh, interesting people's knickers up and down and don't ask decent questions. Now, you will understand 
if we're talking about myths and stereotypes, that's a rather large one because things have moved on a very long way. And also, it's not constructive for getting the results that you want. We don't shout. We don't wave people's knickers in the air. What we do is learn our skill. I've been a barrister now for 33 years. I think I'm just about starting to get good at it. And I mean that genuinely. But one of the reasons for that is new training, new learning. David and Penny have done the most phenomenal work on the Advocates Toolkits. I'm incredibly grateful to them on behalf of the bar as a whole. Uh, Professor Cheryl Thomas, who I see has arrived, has done phenomenal work on busting myths and stereotypes about rape cases. It is all good if we can work collaboratively together. And this research helps us considerably to do that. Although special measures began life in 1999, not all of them did and not all of them are in now. Bizarrely, we still have provisions within that act that have got nowhere near anything. Achieving best evidence is the funniest three words that you will ever hear in the English language because most of the things that occur achieve absolutely the opposite to that. But what was fascinating for me when I had the privilege of being interviewed by John over a link was the clear and complex questions that he asked me, which demonstrated he got it. And I suspect that one of the reasons this research did so well is because practitioners had faith in those asking the questions because they were the right questions asked in the right way. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for sitting from the beginning of a trial to the end. <laughs> that makes all the difference because I absolutely did a dance of joy to hear that there were people who were found not guilty of rape. And actually, from those sitting in the trial process, they understood that that was because in those cases, there were evidential difficulties. Now, that is revolutionary in current research. Thank you for it. And thank you for pointing out that in those cases where there were convictions, the evidence was strong. Who would have thought it? The bus drivers, obviously, but literally no one else has picked up on this because this theme that goes through that there must be more convictions, there must be more convictions. And if you say, how many do you want? The answer is, uh, we don't know, but we'd like more. And we'd like more based on the fact that only 5% of allegations have been proven to be false. Therefore, the conviction rate should be 95%. OK, OK, it's not 95% in homicide, nor is it 95% as far as I remember. But Cheryl will tell me if I've got this wrong. Even where there are indecent images of children on computers, it's not that high. The reality is that what's forgotten here is there's a twofold test. A, did a person consent to sexual intercourse? That's a much easier thing to be able to prove if you're prosecuting, as I do, week in, week out. What's much harder and much more nuanced is whether a defendant had a reasonable belief that a person was consenting. And curiously, when we speak to people who've drafted documents, they don't know that bit of it. This panel of brilliant researchers did. This panel of brilliant researchers understood the law, thank you, and the procedure, and put forward recommendations based upon it. And also took account of the fact that in each trial, there is a vulnerable person who has made an allegation, but there is often a vulnerable person who is on trial. And again, that really is unprecedented. Normally, vulnerable defendants get one or two lines at the bottom saying, oh, and we want a fair trial. Here, there are concrete recommendations on behalf of the vulnerable defendants. I often tell our pupils 
that we, with our apparent high intellect, you can count me out here, I went to a polytechnic, but we, with our high intellect, top 5% of the population, are representing most often people whose IQ puts them in the lowest 5% of the population, who've grown up in the hilariously described as looked after system, or who've had distressing, toxic lives. The idea that this survey and this research, which was undertaken, took account of the fact that defendants require, in order to take an active part in the system, as many rights to special measures as victims is something that the Criminal Bar Association applauds you for, thanks you for, and appreciates the fact that this research is fair and equal and helps us to look forward working with you as to ways to make it better. Because we understand there is work to do. How could there not be? Science, academic research, and what we know about people is changing all of the time. And we are trying to keep up with it and catch up with it. From my perspective, I am representing younger and younger people charged with the most serious offences. Vulnerable witness training, in case you don't know, is a brilliant concept with brilliant organisers. Unfortunately, when I'm training people, I can't pass or fail them. There is no pass or fail. I'd have failed a fair few who can go around saying that they've done witness training. And it was always designed by the Inns of Court College of Advocacy to be the beginning, a foundation course with layers on for the more complex cases. There was no money. We've got to spend money to make sure that we continue to improve and educate ourselves. Because the reality is that vulnerable witnesses require the very best representation that there is, and they require the very best people to question them, to challenge what they say, whether they are a complainant or a defendant. That can only happen with intense training in which we would very much welcome your involvement and your assistance, and, and that is a genuine offer. So if anybody would like to come and assist us with our training or come and watch our training, we would be delighted to have you there. The criminal bar are not shouty people who wave knickers in the air. We are dedicated advocates who have deliberately chosen to earn the least available in the criminal justice system rather than any other system, such as family in which we'd earn double, not that I'm bitter, you understand, in any way, so that we can all work together to make a difference. And we do make a difference. And I am very proud of all of my colleagues who do that. Thank you, Nuffield Foundation, for this incredible gift that you have given us, because we can use this to make real change. We would very much like to make that change collaboratively, working with you. And we also very much appreciate the fact that within this report, that appears to be your aim too, rather than knocking those who are absolutely doing their best. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, very much for giving us um, another perspective. I won't say it from the bus driver's perspective, but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> from, the, from the bar's perspective, and um, in particular highlighting the value of collaboration, because um, that really is, is key, and I think we would all look forward to future collaboration. Uh, and I've spoken a lot this evening about perspectives. The, the last perspective we're going to have is, is a different one um, from Geraldine Hanna, the, the Northern Ireland Victims Commissioner, although Geraldine told me earlier she began her career um, or, or part of her career at the Inner London Crown Court. Um, so she's gone from, from Inner London um, to all the way to um, Northern Ireland to become the Victims Commissioner. So we'll very much look forward to hearing that perspective. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you. The trial took more out of me than the abuse itself. So those are not my words. They are the words of a young woman who came to speak to me, telling me about her experience of the system. Now that young woman was a victim of childhood sexual abuse and yet the experience of cross-examination where she spent three days on the stand 
was so horrific that she found it worse than the abuse she endured as a child. That case was heard early last year in Belfast, 11 years since the establishment of the Advocates Gateway and almost four years since the Gillen review into sexual violence cases in Northern Ireland. Now, just under two years ago, I was appointed Northern Ireland's first commissioner designate for victims of crime. Since then, I've been meeting with victims of all types of crime to understand their experience of our criminal justice system and what can be done to make it better. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you all this evening and to share my insights into that experience, particularly when it comes to cross-examination. I want to take a moment at the outset to thank you all for having me and to congratulate the research team on this wonderful report. I know the work of the Nuffield Foundation, um, it's really important and impactful, so it's a real privilege for me to be here this evening. This piece of work in particular is something I'm particularly interested in because for over 20 years I have worked providing support to victims of crime, both here in London, um, as the judges just said, and also in Northern Ireland. Sadly, in all that time, cross-examination has consistently been identified as one of the most traumatic and difficult parts of the trial for the victim of any crime, but particularly for victims of sexual crime, as you'll be well aware. When I was chief executive of victim support in Northern Ireland, we conducted a court observers project where members of the public were recruited to observe serious sexual assault cases from beginning to end across Northern Irish courts. That was done in 2018 into 2019. Six years later, in reading it again, before, before speaking to you this evening, I still find myself becoming angry at how some of those victims have been treated. To give you a sense of this, one, describe, one observer described the incredulity and sarcasm used when the complainant described decades of rape and sexual abuse by her abusive partner. The observer described how, and I quote, the complainant is so upset she starts retching in the live link room during cross-examination and cried a lot. The defence barrister complained that her distress hampered his questioning and accused the complainant of faking her distress. Now, I wish that that was a real outlier. I wish I could tell you that victims of crime in the last few years who are coming to, are telling me that things are now much better in our courtrooms, certainly not in Northern Ireland. Just a few months ago, a victim of crime told me that cross-examination felt like she was being interrogated by the Gestapo. One victim told me that in her trial, there was a child who was age nine who also alleged abuse, but was de deemed too young to take the stand. But she said it was better that um, the defence barrister was so aggressive that in fact, that, that was a blessing. She said, I'm glad the youngest child who gave a statement didn't go to court. The defence barrister was so horrendous, she would never have coped. Another victim said, after watching what my daughter and my family went through, I would never encourage anyone to take a case like this forward through the courts. The justice system simply isn't fit for purpose. Another victim, the defence barrister was very aggressive and forceful towards me, even shouting at me on the stand, but no one intervened. It was awful. Everyone I have engaged with has painted a remarkably bleak picture of what it's like to engage with our criminal justice system as a victim of crime. Whilst we have made progress with the introduction of special measures, we still encounter issues with the quality of ABEs. And I continue to hear examples of domestic abuse cases where a failure to apply for special measures in advance of contests, which is in our magistrate courts, leaves victims fearful and uncertain as to whether they will have to give evidence in the courtroom right up until the day of the hearing. Now, there are, of course, positives. I agree with the researchers finding that across all the jurisdictions, there was a willingness on behalf of practitioners of all kinds to improve the cross-examination experience for vulnerable witnesses and to help them achieve best evidence. In recent years, recommendations stemming from the Gillen Review has led to the creation of bespoke remote evidence centres where victims can give evidence from dedicated suites designed for that per specific purpose away from the court environment. We have also in Northern Ireland introduced the role of sexual offence legal advisors, or SOLAs as they're called, to help protect the Article 8 rights of victims, as well as the pilot of new arrangements to fast-track sexual violence cases, which 
you just heard Judge Patricia Smith um, outline, and I must say she was very modest in how she described it. That pilot and protocol was spearheaded by Patricia and is successful as a result of her leadership in that regard. These positives are positive, or these developments are positive, and they definitely see us moving in the right direction. The victims who I've spoken to have availed of those, have welcomed them, and this is definitely a cause for hope. I also believe that for the most part, there is a willingness to move away from the traditional advocacy model towards the best evidence model that better cares for victims of crime. But that movement in Northern Ireland continues to be glacially slow and frustratingly inconsistent. So I'm not therefore surprised to read that the change of pace has been found in the report to be considerably slower in Northern Ireland. I love where I come from, I really do. Um, across these islands, you'll not find more strikingly beautiful coastlines than our north coast. And our people are famously warm and full of fun. But there are things about Northern Ireland that I'm not as proud of. And unfortunately, how we treat our vulnerable victims in our criminal justice system is one of those. The failures are widespread and they go beyond cross-examination. But there's no doubt the cross-examination of vulnerable witnesses in Northern Ireland, particularly when it comes to sexual crime, can be horrific and re-traumatising. There are defence barristers that I know fill prosecutors and those working within our witness services with dread. Whilst it is by no means reflective of all of the defence counsel, and let me be clear of that, there are some practitioners who continue to be disrespectful in their cross-examination, persistently using tag questions, continuing to call victims liars, and are openly aggressive and repetitive in their style of questioning. <coughs> Let me be very clear. I know defence barristers have an essential and a difficult job to do. A truly fair and effective justice system does not just need skilled people to provide the best possible defence to their clients. It actually depends on it. I am very supportive of good, effective cross-examination that provides the best possible defence, but also respects the dignity and vulnerability of witnesses and victims and enables them to give their best evidence. This is why training and tools such as the Advocates Toolkit are so necessary. And I know it's possible. I know it can be done. In the report that I referred to earlier, some of the observers noted the times when defence barristers carried out cross-examinations respectfully. To quote one of those observers, at one, point, at one point there were technical problems with the ABE and the defence barrister asks if someone told the poor girl in the other room what was going on. It seemed as if he found this very important. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but it's getting the basics right. And everything I've learned in my experience is about it's about getting the basics right, that providing that little bit of humanity that makes such a difference and is of so, such importance to victims. And that can be the case regardless of what the verdict is in the case as well. So I have had victims who have spoken to me and have said that they find the cross-examination difficult, but fair. Some of those have went on to find, have guilty verdicts, some not guilty verdicts. So it's not just a case that it's those people who do not have a guilty verdict who have issues with our system. The question I continue to ask is if some barristers are able to treat victims with that level of respect and dignity, why can't they all? It is neither fair nor just that a victim's chances of being treated fairly and with respect comes down to the luck of which barrister has been instructed in the case. And it's not just defence barristers that they are, are the issue. We have an inconsistent approach from the judiciary with regards to agreeing ground rules in advance of the hearing and their willingness to intervene when questions are inappropriate. Prosecutors are also inconsistent in terms of their own interventions, sensitivity and communication in advance with vulnerable victims. That is why I really do welcome the recommendation regarding mandatory training. All practitioners should better understand the impact that they have on victims and witnesses. Now, I'm aware I've presented a fairly bleak picture of what it's like to be a victim of crime in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, I can only say that it's really simply a reflection of the individuals who come to speak to me 
and my job is to help amplify their voices. But given the challenges we have, work like this research are all the more important. One of my biggest frustrations with the justice system is the lack of really good usable data. Pieces of research like this are important because they provide a much more solid evidence base for decision, makings to be, decision makers to make decisions on. In Northern Ireland, the criminal justice organisations and the prior devolved government have committed to create an effective, victim-centred, trauma-informed justice system that truly delivers for all victims. Unfortunately, these aspirations fall short of what victims are experiencing in reality. Much of what I have outlined this evening comes down to practitioners taking a little bit more time to think, plan and act with sensitivity. However, I'm also too aware that the system also needs a serious injection of funding to help address the current capacity issues, tackle backlogs and effectively transform the system for the future. My message to us all here, which is one I hope to really soon share with a new, newly formed executive in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. If we are to truly make good on our promises to victims, what is needed now is concrete action, real change and significant resources. If we are able to use research such as this to help make the trial process less harmful to the most vulnerable users of our system, then that would be a welcome step. Thank you all for your attention.